Hello everyone and welcome to the Innovations in Vaccine Technologies webinar hosted by the Knowledge Transfer Network. My name is Karen Wilkinson. I work in the health team at the KTN. Um, this webinar has been run as part of our Medicines Manufacturing Challenge community, whose purpose it is to accelerate the outcomes from the Medicines Manufacturing ISCF Challenge. And I work alongside my colleagues, Marcel and Gabriella, on this challenge, and you can see our contact details there in the slide. Um, we wanted to give a platform to some of the companies that we know who are working on really innovative enabling technologies which will form part of the picture in the huge effort which has been, which is underway to develop and deliver vaccines in the UK. Um, and here's our agenda for today. We've lined up a selection of five of these companies who will each give a short presentation on their work, followed by an update from the Vaccines Manufacturing Innovation Centre. Then there'll be a panel Q&A session. Um, and after that, Gordon Ford from Innovate UK and my colleague, Gabriella Juarez Martinez, We'll discuss some current funding opportunities that are available. Um, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Bagshaw to start the session. Steve sits on the Vaccine Task Force Manufacturing um, Supply Board and the BIA's Expert Advisory Panel. Steve's currently working with the Vaccines Manufacturing Task Force on supply chain activities. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, Karen. And um, what a pleasure to be invited to speak and join these companies who are going to present to you this afternoon. I wonder if you can remember what you were doing six months ago, 29th of January, 2020. Perhaps if you took a look at your diary, you'd see something similar to what I saw. I'd just come back from an, a, a travel abroad. I was in the office for three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'd had face-to-face one-to-ones all morning. I'd had lunch with the chairman of our pension trustees in a restaurant across a table. And this afternoon, we were going to have our leadership team meeting. And we were a bit annoyed about it because there were four video links that we had to use. And we still felt that face-to-face -face was a better way of doing that. That was six months ago. And it seems like a lifetime. And with all the personal stories that go with it, it can seem it was another age. However, in vaccine development, six months is a blink of the eye. Normally, we talk about vaccine development in years. All of you now are used to the kind of things that people are talking about all the time. How many preclinical vaccines are there? How many phase one, phase two vaccines are there? And the numbers that we work with in the pharmaceutical industry, you're perhaps more familiar with now than you ever were before. You need 250 preclinical candidates to get to 10 phase one candidates. In phase one, you do the safety efficacy. In, te in 10 phase one candidates, go to five phase two candidates. Phase two, you do a bit more deeper safety work and push the efficacy, bar efficacy boundary a bit further. From the five phase two candidates, you end up with two phase three candidates. And there you do the double blind test, so-called because Neither the prescribing physician nor the volunteer know whether they've had the placebo or the vaccine that you're testing out. From those two, we expect one to be successful. It takes two years normally to go through phase one, two years through phase two, and three years through phase three. If you've gone well, in seven years, you'll get from somewhere like preclinical to approved. And here we are today with 142 vaccines in preclinical, 17 in phase one, 13 in phase two, and five in phase three. It's no wonder that when the chief scientific advisor is asked, how, what's the chance of us having a vaccine by Christmas? His answer is around about 30%. What's the chance of having a vaccine next year? Maybe 50%. Those are the kinds of numbers that we're dealing with. And that's why you'll hear people talk about multiple shots on goal and why we need to use the, the different modalities and we need to hack them all. And so you'll have seen in the news this morning another vaccine that the government is backing. And this is all part of the work of the Vaccine Task Force. Working together since 
um, April and then in May, Kate Bingham was appointed to lead the vaccine task force reporting directly to Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister. And prior to that, the bio industries community, the bioprocessing community had got together in March and April and said, let's not drop the ball. While the world gets itself ordered, let's make sure that the Oxford vaccine and the Imperial vaccine that looked promising at the time, let's make sure that we ensure there's enough people, enough equipment, we can scale it up correctly, and that we can have the, the raw materials in place. And so for those first two months of lockdown, we worked together across the community, making sure that by working together, we increase the chance of success. And now that vaccine task force, officially run by the UK government, is in place and it's doing the same thing with work streams on selection and procurement, trials, tests and regulation, manufacturing and supply, deployment, international collaboration and legacy. And they're in place, those work streams now, forging forward and trying to make sure that the multiple shots on goal work. The different modalities, you hear that phrase now more than you ever heard it before, adenovirus vaccine, the Oxford vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine is the one the UK is backing. You might be looking at um, an RNA vaccine. And you'll see multiple RNA vaccines in the news, but the one the UK government's backing is from Pfizer um, and also um, the German company. And those two together are being used, adenovirus and the um, RNA vaccine, those two together are the, are the leading ones. But they've also signed up um, another different modality, which is the whole inactivated virus modality. Another good one, this one, Valneva. And this is the kind of vaccine you'd have learned about at school in terms of what vaccines have traditionally been over the years. Then today's adjuvanted um, protein is also joined by something called a neutralized antibody. And we're looking at all of these vaccines and looking for the most promising candidates to try and back them and try and make sure there are population scale doses available. Obviously this year would be best, but certainly in next year. And so it's a very exciting time where the science is coming together, being used across the, across the industry to make sure that we have the maximum chance of giving that population scale protection. Not just a UK, venture. Obviously, you look across the world, you'll see governments doing this. My own company, Fujifilm, was thrilled to receive a visit from President Trump earlier this week, looking at a, a, an antibody vaccine that would be made in our facility there. These are the kind of things that are grabbing the headline. And you'll see that across what you're going to see later today. You'll see some really interesting ways in which not just the modalities that you see, but also the ways in which you deliver the vaccine and deploy it are important. Then you're also going to see some science which says, okay, those five modalities are good, but there are different ways of doing it too. And then finally, you're going to hear a story from Matthew about what Britain is doing in terms of putting on the ground capacity and capability for the long term. So these are all part of what the Vaccine Task Force is doing together. And it's something that I think as the UK, we can be proud of what the science has so far created and given us a real chance of playing our part as a community in making sure that we overcome this virus and try and get us back as close to that normal that six months ago, we were all living. So I'm gonna say some more at the end of this set of presentations. And we're going to have some Q&A that you can ask questions to and feel free to ask about anything that I've talked about, but also the five presenters you're going to have and Matthew's presentation on the Vaccines Innovation Centre. Please ask questions too, but for now, I'm going to hand back to Karen. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we'll go straight to our showcase presentations now. And just before we start, as Steve said, there's going to be um, a Q&A session after all of the companies have finished their presentations. Um, we already had some questions through the registration system and we'll be monitoring the questions that come up in the uh, chat on YouTube throughout the presentation. So uh, do use that forum to ask questions and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. So um, our first presentation comes from Laurent Duroux, who is Senior Research Scientist at Croda Europe. Thank you, Laurent. 
Hello, um, and welcome to this uh, presentation. I'm Laurent Duroux, um, research scientist at CRODA uh, in Denmark, and essentially responsible for the development of um, new adjuvants. So CRODA is um, uh, an international company an international company uh, founded in uh, 1925 and uh, we have specialized over the years in uh, specialty ingredients, in particular super refined uh, ingredients covering different uh, uh, market sectors uh, in personal care, um, life sciences, uh, including crop care and health care and also uh, performance technologies. Croda um, has um, recently uh, grown into uh, the life science uh, market, essentially by uh, acquiring a few specialized companies, um, in, uh, in particular in the manufacture of uh, vaccine adjuvants. And this is where I come into the picture. Um, so, um, So one of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemics is that it has suddenly exposed to the general public uh, the current dynamics uh, in the industry of vaccines and uh, a snapshot uh, in the state of the art um, of uh, vaccine technology and of course, uh, adjuvant technology and also uh, research and development. So as you know, uh, WHO keeps uh, a track of all publicly reported projects and uh, a few sites uh, compile and organize this information like uh, the Milken Institute uh, in Washington DC from which I've extracted this uh, chart. And uh, it shows that there are over uh, 200 projects covering all current strategies or modalities uh, used in vaccine design, uh, traditional and modern and uh, 23 of which are currently in clinical trials. Um, so if we break down uh, these, uh, the strategies used uh, against uh, this coronavirus, it shows that uh, about one fifth of um, the, the trials or, or let's say the projects are um, concerning repurposed viral vectors uh, and these are uh, amongst which, uh, which are the most advanced in, uh, in clinical trials at the moment. Um, uh, one fifth is using uh, DNA or mRNA uh, vaccine technology, and about two fifths uh, are based on more traditional vaccines, uh, like for example, uh, attenuated or inactivated uh, coronavirus, and also uh, protein subunits, meaning antigens. And um, Browsing uh, quickly through um, these, um, the titles of these uh, listed projects, it showed that about 12% 12, 12 of these uh, vaccine projects are using uh, adjuvants um, in their projects. This is just to say that uh, eventually uh, a company like us who's dedicated in making vaccine adjuvants would have dreamt of seeing more adjuvants used in these projects, but nevertheless, um, about 12% uh, are used in, uh, in, uh, in these vaccines. So uh, looking at also uh, more details, which type of adjuvants are used, uh, there's a wide palette of different adjuvants amongst traditional adjuvants like aluminum salts, which are, we are producing, or uh, MF59, um, which is a um, uh, water and oil emulsion, and as well as modern adjuvants, in particular TLR agonists. <clears throat> Sorry. I want to go back. Hmm. Um, so if we look at uh, traditional vaccines, um, sorry. Next slide there. If we look at uh, which, um, what are adjuvants in vaccines? Adjuvants are added to restore or to improve immunogenicity to antigens with as little impact as possible on tolerability and uh, toxicity, of course. And since their inception in the late 20s, uh, the discovery of uh, aluminum uh, particles as uh, adjuvants 
Mike Glenny. Uh, in fact, these salts uh, as, as adjuvants have dominated the, the market until the, uh, the 20s, where new generations uh, of adjuvants were introduced, such as, uh, for example, milder, less toxic form of the front uh, adjuvant. And that was uh, the introduction by Novartis of MNF59, uh, a water uh, in oil emulsion based on squalene, natural organic oil. And the last 20 years have seen really a blossoming in adjuvant research, leading to the emergence of new types in various vaccines, essentially as a result of the impulse of uh, GSK, um, whose researcher understood that combining adjuvants led to even better uh, immune response in terms of intensity and uh, specificity. And this was the uh, so-called AS0 uh, uh, platform. Um, so adjuvant research is constantly moving uh, and forward, uh, moving forward, uh, and propelled essentially by, by uh, progresses in uh, supramolecular chemistry and nanotechnology, uh, which have. Um, generated uh, a range of uh, uh, special uh, carriers for antigens, such as virus-like like particles, VLPs, but also uh, in our understanding of uh, modern biology, and that system biology uh, or uh, molecular immunology. And I will uh, show this more on the next slide. So Crowd has a strong ambition for playing a leading role in vaccine adjuvants. And after the acquisition of uh, Biosector Denmark, uh, which is producing aluminum salts and Kilaya saponins, Croda recently acquired Avanti Polar Lipids, uh, which is producing MPL uh, and cationic amphiphils, which are components of the CAF adjuvant line, as presented on this slide. So um, you can see that uh, Croda is in fact present in uh, most of the uh, adjuvant types uh, currently used in, in uh, either uh, clinical trials, so prototype vaccines, or also in licensed vaccines. Um, this thing is not responsive. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can't see the uh, the arrow. Nah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, next slide. So, uh, in fact, uh, vaccines um, are growing uh, understanding of the immune response, in particular the innate immune response, where adjuvants have got a major role to play, and how the immune uh, innate response orchestrates the adaptive uh, immune response. Uh, in particular, the discovery of so-called TLR receptors in the mid-80s uh, has boosted uh, research, um, adjuvant research in particular, um, to uh, be able to create new generation of adjuvants, able to control uh, more precisely uh, the type of immune response. So I won't get into the details, but there's a number of modern adjuvants which are uh, essentially agonists of these uh, TLR receptors. And uh, their role is to activate the immune, uh, the innate immune response, uh, in particular uh, uh, antigen presenting, cell, presenting cells, and uh, to also uh, improve the uh, antigen uptake and processing and presentation by the uh, MHCs, MHC class uh, proteins. So in uh, fine, I would like to, uh, to say that um, CRODA, uh, again, to, to restate that CRODA uh, is um, trying to generate uh, and is uh, generating uh, new uh, lines of adjuvants and uh, try to be the first in class uh, in terms of uh, vaccine adjuvants and by uh, provides currently um, many vaccines with uh, aluminum particle suspensions with allydrogel and adjufos um, as well as uh, kilaya saponins and uh, through the acquisition of antipolar lipids, um, Croda is now uh, available, uh, capable of um, providing uh, MPL uh, type of adjuvant as well as cationic lipids, which are, uh, for example, the components in the CAF uh, type of adjuvant. And of course, um, Croda has got uh, expertise and uh, is able to uh, help uh, any customers uh, by troubleshooting and uh, uh, providing support to uh, all customers. So I will um, have to finish this talk. Um, uh, welcome all uh, your uh, questions to the following um, email address, uh, which is hceurope at croda.com. Thank you very much for listening, and sorry very much for the uh, technical problems I've encountered to pass the slides. Bye bye. Laurent, thank you. Um, so our next uh, presentation is from Kristen Albright, who is Chief Operating Officer at Procarium. Thanks for the introduction, Karen. Good afternoon. 
I'm Kristen Albright, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Precarium. Precarium is a venture-backed biopharmaceutical company located in central London. We have raised 18 million US dollars to date, and we'll be closing an additional 20 million Series B financing in the third quarter of 2020 this year. Precarium was originally founded on the premise of finding innovative ways of using your own immune system to fight for you. Founded originally as a vaccine company, which actually I'll be speaking about today. In 2018, we pivoted into microbial immunotherapy space, leveraging our bacteria's intrinsic ability to home to tumors. Our lead indication in oncology is for the treatment and prevention of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, which we believe our therapy will be able to replace the standard of care, BCG, and therefore alleviate the BCG vaccine supply issue for the prevention of tuberculosis a disease that still causes over 1 million deaths per year. As a pharmacist and having traveled over 100 countries, including some of the most remote areas on our planet, oral delivery is the gold standard of care for therapeutic products. So the question remains is why wouldn't we aim to have oral vaccines? This is one of the reasons I joined Precarium. Not only mechanistically does it make sense to the types of immune responses created via oral administration, but also it allows the person, the actual individual, the patient, the, the parent, the child to take their own health into their hands by having a vaccine available at the local pharmacy not just medical clinics that are few and far between in remote places. As most infections occur crossing mucosal barriers, Precarium has focused on developing, developing a live attenuated strain of salmonella to mimic the natural infection of enteric pathogens. The proposed mechanism of action of Precarium's live attenuated salmonella strain is seen here. Upon oral administration, a genetically modified strain, in this case, Precarium salmonella typhi, uh, is swallowed, survives the stomach, and then reaches the small intestine. Microfold cells, or also known as M cells, are found in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue of the payer's patches which is the mucous membrane lining of the small intestine. The M cells are unique in that they lack microvilli, but like other epithelial cells, they are characterized by strong cell junctions. This provides a physical barrier that is important uh, for the defense between the gut uh, contents and the immune system of the host. M cells are known to initiate mucosal immunity responses and allow for the transport of particles, including microbes, across the epithelial lining from the gut lumen to the lamina propria, where interactions with immune cells can take place. Here, antigens are delivered. In our case, four different antigens are delivered to antigen secreting cells. And this allows for the development of both cellular and humoral immune responses. So Intervax is Precarium's lead program, and although COVID is top of mind today, I'd like to touch upon another disease called enteric fever that is endemic to, to low and middle income country settings. Intervax is our lead program, and it's a two-strain bivalent vaccine based on, a, based on our live attenuated chassis system that has been genetically modified to express additional two immunogenic antigens of, of Salmonella paratype A, the lipopolysaccharide and the flagellin. We're very excited about this program and we believe that it has a potential in the market of both the travelers as well as the endemic setting. As discussed earlier, the oral administration as well as the broader coverage are just two of the advantages of Intervax. However, the key advantage since joining Precarium I have learned is the ease of manufacturing and the scalability of oral live attenuated strains as they do not require downstream purification and the GMP quality release is less stringent than parenteral products. In our manufacturing estimations, we have estimated that one commercial run in which the process only takes one week from start to finish 
can produce approximately 400,000 doses in one week. And this will allow enough doses to be produced either one, by a single facility, or this allows Precarium or other groups the ability to tech transfer the established process to uh, in-country manufacturing in such a uh, low and middle income country setting. So then the question is always, what's next for Precarium? So on top of the, the 6 million US dollars we received from the Wellcome Trust to, to support Intervax last year, we will have our initial readout of our first in human phase one UK trial in the first quarter of 2021. Based on positive data, Precarium plans to continue development of Intervax through the support of Wellcome by initiating an age descending dose escalation study in the low and middle income country setting. Likely this will be in Dhaka, Bangladesh, as paratype EA infections are high in that area. In parallel, and to speed up commercialization, as Steve mentioned earlier during the introduction, we will also work with the Oxford Vaccine Group, which has established both the typhoid and paratyphoid human challenge models. That leaves the last question uh, that most investors actually investing in Precarium have asked. I myself was previously an investor in the States and early stage companies. And the question is, will field studies be required? As you see with the COVID vaccine, approximately 30,000 patients or, or subjects, healthy subjects are required for a field study. And this is something that we have to take into account into every vaccine. So here, after our phase one trial, Precarium plans to have an end of phase one meeting with regulators to understand, can we determine a bioequivalence with either additional oral vaccine or a typhoid conjugate vaccine in order to accelerate approval of our product? Of course, as we all must realize in the vaccine world and that we've seen with COVID vaccines, a very good safety profile on top of efficacy is of the utmost importance for bringing a successful vaccine, both to the market as well as to those who need it. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and our next presentation will be from Simon Newman, who's Chief Scientific Officer at Nanogenics. Okay. Okay, I'd just like to thank the organisers for giving us a chance to speak today. And I think really emphasise the points that Steve made earlier, that this isn't really a race with one single winner. We're going to need many different modalities and effective treatments, not just to fight this wave of COVID, the subsequent waves of COVID coming through. Nanogenics is a small biotech company in the gene therapy space. We're developing our own products in the field of oncology, glycoma and cystic fibrosis. And all our products is the same vehicle. And this is key to the proposal I'm going to talk about today. This is a small self-assembling peptide nanoparticle. I'll show the structure on the next slide. And this allows us to package any nucleic acid and have targeted uptake into different cell types. For today's talk, the focus is obviously on coronavirus. And what we're looking to do is repurpose our cystic fibrosis program and actually develop a way of delivering a DNA vaccine via a simple nasal spray. This potentially has many advantages over the more traditional intramuscular injection. It mimics the primary route of coronavirus and obviously other respiratory viruses. It might seem like a minor point, but if you're looking to roll out globally, the ability to have needle three administration can be quite crucial, reducing the need for trained healthcare workers and the risk of needle stick injuries across the globe. It's already used in children for flu vaccination. And probably one of the key things here is we're looking to stimulate a different kind of immune response, which is potentially more relevant to respiratory diseases and will not only protect person vaccinated against infection, but also risk, reduce the risk of transmission. And what we're looking to do is stimulate what's called an IgA type of antibody response. These antibodies are present in the mucosa lining the respiratory tract. And these really are the body's first line of defense against respiratory infection. 
So if we can simulate an IgA-led response in the mucosa, we can hopefully prevent coronavirus infection spreading down the respiratory tract into the lungs and therefore patients requiring hospitalization and having a serious disease outcome. In addition, we will be looking to stimulate, as most other um, vaccines have to date, a cellular-based response. So clearly is evidence that not everybody infected with coronavirus is producing antibodies there as well. And I think very relevant to today's topic and conversation as well, is when it comes to manufacturing, this is a self-assembling peptide nanoparticle made of fairly basic, robust components, many of which have been used in other clinical settings previously, and can be assembled via a relatively simple microfluidix methodology. So just a little bit more about the particle itself. As I said, it's a peptide nanoparticle. The peptide we use is around 30 amino acids, and at one end, there's a payload binding element. This binds to the payload, whether it be DNA, siRNA, and forms the core of the particle. This is shown in yellow on the, um, oh, this is shown in yellow on the cartoon here. At the other end is a simple loop structure. And onto here, we can insert amino acid sequences to bind to cell surface receptors and proteins. This is key because by binding to these receptors, we get active uptake into the cell, in contrast to fairly standard liposomal delivery vehicles, where it's more of a passive process. And we can also then target this approach. Um, and then the shown in blue, we do have a lipid component as well. The reason this was added to the particle is once inside the cell, it needs to escape the endosome. And this facilitates escape from the endosome. Our clinical plan, uh, sorry, our science plan is fairly simple and rapid. We're just concluding investment to take this through. And we're aiming that within eight months, we will have in vivo evidence to show antibody production following respiratory delivery of a liptide particle containing DNA encoding for the spike protein. And as I said early, earlier, we are working with our immunologists to also look at delivering additional epitopes to try and maximize the cellular response as well as the IgA response, because clearly this is going to be crucial to have an effective vaccine. So I think one of the worries with a purely antibody-led response is how durable and how long the protection will be. Because obviously all the studies to date and in vivo studies that everybody's generated Generally, the animals have been dosed and maybe two, three weeks later, they've been challenged. Whereas obviously for the final product, we'd be looking probably for at least a year's protection from reinfection. So I think generating that robust response is essential. Once we've achieved that, we will move forward with um, doing infection challenges. And then we'll look for further financing or to partner this delivery technology with other companies to then take forward to the clinic. I think one thing that's really interesting at the moment is I'm aware that both the Imperial Group led by Robin Chatsock and Sarah Gilbert at Oxford have discussed the feasibility that in the future, their vaccine payloads may work better if delivered nasally. And this is something that if we can get our proof of principle achieved in this first eight to 12 months, we could also have the option of delivering other people's payloads, which I think is quite an exciting prospect. And in conclusion, I won't go through all these bullet points here, but just very briefly, I think to emphasize, I, as I said at the beginning, I don't see this as a race. I think we need multiple solutions to this problem, not just for this way, the coronavirus, but subsequent waves. And I think it's important to try and replicate the way the coronavirus works to stimulate that IgA response. And we think with Liptide, we can do that with a simple to manufacture uh, delivery vehicle. So I'll end there now. And that was great, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, our fourth presentation comes from Roger Coulston, who's Chief Scientific Officer at AQ. Thank you very much, Karen. So uh, I'd firstly like to begin by uh, thanking the KTN for the very kind in invitation to uh, present uh, to you today. Uh, so AQ. is a, uh, a British-based chemtech spin-out company from the University of Cambridge. 
Uh, we're commercializing our, our technology that addresses air quality and healthcare opportunities. And we have a number of different products uh, on the market today, uh, and you can get uh, this uh, from one of our bathroom products from Ocado uh, at the moment. We have a super molecular technology and it's called AQBIT. Uh, and this was recently tested at the University of Cambridge and been shown to be effective at neutralizing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus. Uh, and more importantly, it doesn't harm the cells. Uh, the technology or unique to us uh, is that the technology is available at multi-ton scale. Uh, and we have extensive human health and environmental safety data to go uh, with this material. So we describe it as it neutralizes COVID and is kind to you. So we believe the technology has the potential to significantly reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19, particularly for soft furnishing sprays, as well as on personal surfaces. So thinking of your, your, um, your face masks. Uh, we'd like to look at uh, reducing airborne transmission, in particular around con confined spaces uh, through personal sprays. Uh, if you think of taxis and elevators, uh, and we are also looking at potential as a diagnostic, so using it as an inactivating virus uh, transport media, uh, which has a number of different applications of potential to strip cost out of the, the supply chain. Uh, it's very different to most disinfectants because it's not uh, destructive on cells, it's inhibiting uh, the virus, so therefore safer to use in different contexts. So how does it work? So the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus we know is an RNA encased uh, with a lipid membrane. That outer surface is basically decorated with glycoproteins and has the envelope stabilized by cholesterol. We know that our technology uh, is well known to bind amino acids, peptides, proteins, and cholesterol. And so we, we anticipate that there's three different mechanisms uh, that it could, could work by. Uh, first one, membrane disruption, so stripping the cholesterol out and just deactivating um, the virus surface. Uh, which I think is less likely due to the, the safety profile of our technology, more likely it's binding inhibition. So we're, we're decorating the surface of the, the virus particle and inhibiting that, uh, the spike proteins and stopping them from being able to get uh, into, the, into the cells. Uh, we're also now looking at replication disruption. So are we able to inhibit uh, the replication of, of the virus? I'll now talk you through a little bit of data just to give you a flavor of what we've done. We've looked at a number of different products uh, and these are formulations or uh, ingredients. Uh, and we can see basically level of inhibition uh, giving an IC50, uh, high, medium and low in this case. Uh, and we also look at cell impact. Uh, so the impact uh, of cell survival. And you can see uh, AQ340 had no inhibition uh, and had no effect on the virus, but had also had no effect on the cell. So Okay, that's, that is what it is. Uh, 341 and 342 show very good inhibition uh, of the virus, uh, and they also don't have uh, any uh, impact on cell survival uh, or cell death, sorry. Uh, we also took our, our technology and we mixed it with uh, lactic acid and SLES, which are well-known uh, disinfectants. They're known to, to um, basically kill microbes. Uh, and in that test, you basically see that there's complete destruction, so disinfection, um, uh, process. So this is where we see this is quite a unique uh, neutralizing effect uh, without uh, damaging cells, which has important safety implications on how you use the technology. Uh, if we look at the a little bit more into the detail of the neutralization effect, we did this work with Professor Ian Goodfellow uh, from the University of Cambridge. It was done on a pseudotype virus in a CL2 lab, which is safer and far quicker to do uh, the, the testing. If you look at the AQ340, um, on the y-axis, you've got cell infection level. You can see that it had literally no impact on inhibiting that cell uh, at the various different dilutions. Uh, but then 341, it shows a, a nice level of um, inhibition. So IC50 of 108, which effectively means dilute the product 100, 100 fold and you'll get half of the population uh, inhibited. Uh, and our better system 342 is a thousand fold dilution. And this translates to about uh, five to 12 or sort of single digit micrograms per mil um, inhibition uh, or IC50s or PPMs. We also see a trend so we can see uh, the design of this and we, we believe we can get this working even uh, more efficiently. So to summarize, we've got a proprietary technology uh, that has the potential to neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus without killing cells. 
Uh, it has the potential to significantly reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19, particularly on, as a spray on soft furnishings, personal surfaces, uh, and with the potential to reduce airborne transmission in confined spaces, uh, as well as diagnostics. The technology is in the market, scalable, and is not persistent or hazardous to the environment uh, or health. Uh, we're now currently seeking partnerships with consumer goods companies. Uh, we're also working or looking to work with healthcare and pharma companies to accelerate the solutions to market. This is not something that we can do on our own. Our next steps, we're going through uh, specific application uh, or application specific regulatory work that needs to be done. Uh, we've got further formulation and technology, technology optimization. I think we can get this working even, even better. Uh, more complicated but more exciting is the efficacy testing for aerosols, uh, proving that you can deactivate in the, in the air would be a, a tremendous result, uh, as well as working on proof of concept for the diagnostics work uh, and working on our scale up and, and manufacturing. So I'll conclude by uh, thanking the KTN again for the uh, guidance and support as well as the Innovate UK and Professor Ian Goodfellow and Luke Meredith from the Department of Pathology for running the tests. Uh, for us and thank you everyone for your kind attention. Thank you Roger. Um, so now to our last company presentation and that's from David Hipkiss who's CEO at Anisi Pharma. Anisi Pharma, sorry. Okay, brilliant. Apologies for the short interruption. Uh, I'll talk to you today about Anisi Pharma and Implavax, uh, which is uh, something very different to what you've heard today. Uh, but something very exciting, not just in the COVID world, but actually for vaccines uh, writ large. Um, so Anisi are based in Oxfordshire, uh, and we're very different to uh, any other vaccine company in the world, in that we are developing uh, the next generation of what we determine unit solid dose vaccine products. Uh, these are enabled and made using our Implavax formulation and device technologies, which we'll see shortly. And critically, they are needle free, they're thermally stable, they are also immuno-enhancing and they're very cost-effective. Our human factor studies to date also show a very strong subject preference uh, for that over traditional means. What we've been able to show to date is that our uh, technology allowed us to be both target and indication agnostic. That's both from a disease state and vaccine construct state. And we have a wealth of preclinical data, which is growing all the time, showing our effectiveness and the breadth of our applications. Like many others, we have a great SAB and we're based uh, in Oxfordshire. Uh, there now follows a short two minute uh, animation, which will uh, tell you a little bit more about Implavax. I'll go silent during that time and then I'll come back to you. Almost all vaccines are administered in liquid or suspension form using a needle and syringe. This traditional method has significant disadvantages, including, for example, needle phobia, needle stick injury, risk of cross-infection, waste disposal, cold chain management challenges, and needs a high level of skill for administration. Inisi's new Implavax Solid Dose Needle-Free Vaccine Technology Platform makes vaccination quick, easy, error-free, and highly effective. Implavax is broadly applicable and can be used in both routine and campaign settings. It's needle-free by design, reducing needle phobia and eliminating needle stick injury. Easy, simple and rapid administration is achieved by simple downward pressure of the device onto the skin with minimal, if any, training required. The Implavax system consists of three integrated elements. The reusable actuator, the preloaded single-use cassette and the solid dose vaccine implant. The solid dose implant is delivered approximately two millimeters below the surface of the skin. It contains the vaccine which completely dissolves post delivery. Dosing errors and the need to mix and shoot are eliminated thanks to the precision engineered unit dose. End-to-end -end cold chain logistical challenges are reduced because of the Implavax excellent thermal stability. The preloaded single-use cassette contains the vaccine implant. A lockout mechanism prevents reuse and eliminates cross-contamination post-use. The reusable actuator automatically resets after each dose delivery and can be reused up to a thousand times. The Implavax system has shown equivalent or better efficacy 
and dose and regimen sparing compared to standard vaccines. Patients have shown a strong preference for Implavax over traditional administration methods. Vaccination saves lives. Maximize its effectiveness and transform your patient's experience. Visit inicipharma.com today. Hi, thank you for watching the video. I has trust you enjoyed that. Um, a video is one thing, but the real thing is also important. So just to show you here, that's that applicator you saw. Here is the unit solid dose. We simply connect, we take the protected top off, and to achieve a vaccination, and we're done. So that's Implavax. Uh, how do we go about these things? Well, we start with uh, raw materials uh, from our bulk vaccine partners. We take some excipients. And then we have a combination of processes uh, to make what we determine a universal vaccine implant. There are three processes matched to each vaccine. Certain vaccines are more sensitive than others. Uh, proteinaceous species are pretty robust. Viral vector species are a little bit less robust. But they all come out with the same type of uh, implant, as we can see here, four millimeters long, less than a millimeter wide, of a structural strength and an engineered sharp tip to aid its penetration into the skin without the use of a needle. Uniquely, uh, we are able to control the physicochemical properties of the input materials in the solid phase. And as a consequence of that, we could control the elution, dissolution, and therefore the effect of the antigen in the body over time. This might allow us to do a delayed release, a sustained release, or even a pulsatile release. It also allows us to put uh, very different vaccines together in the same implant, which might be important uh, when we're looking at combination therapy or indeed prime and boost regimens. As you've seen from the video and my own demonstration, we also have a multi-use system and more recently a single-use system, which we've been asked to consider uh, following um, some uh, discussions with our partners. You will have also heard, I'm sure, and the UK government have taken the leadership in this, um, in terms of, you'll hear a bit more from Matt, but you have to be able to make things at scale. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that we can and we are, and any of our processes to date are readily scalable to the tens of millions of doses worldwide. Okay. A little bit of data always helps, um, just some exemplar, uh, not everything we do. Here up in the first example, just to look at these three graphs, we're doing a comparison of the same vaccine. This is a monodiphtheria one. This bar here shows you the neutralizing antibody response of the standard vaccine in a liquid needle and syringe after three doses. Uh, you'll see here it's compared to the solid dose equivalent. And what you'll see very quickly here, we've got the same level of response, but with using one less dose. This means we only need two doses rather than three doses to achieve an immune threshold. That could be really important when vaccine supply is limited. It also greatly aids compliance and adherence. Interestingly here, when you take the solid dose and redissolve it and deliver it as a liquid, um, you don't get the same effect as if it's in the solid form, thereby confirming that a solid dose uh, vaccine in this sense has an effect in its own right. Another opportunity here, more peptide based, this is comparing the solid dose form of an anthrax recombinant protective antigen compared to the biothrax standard. Uh, you'll see here that that's a two dose regimen with the commercial standard. Um, you have to give it uh, twice before you get over the immune threshold. What you see here is the solid dose equivalent from a single dose. There's a faster, more quicker onset of action. It's sustained through the immune threshold over a period of time. And then with the second dose, it ends up being eight to nine times better than the standard. In flu, which we've done some work and are doing more so, this is a measure of reduced transmission. Everyone will be very familiar with the R number and the need to keep that below, uh, uh, below one. What we found here that using a solid dose implant um, is with regards to uh, reducing transmission and viral shedding, which is quite important. Seasonal allergy here, this one, we've actually removed the need to use an adjuvant altogether. Uh, here, we've got excellent thermal stability, in this case, 56 degrees Celsius in terms of its temperature stability over time. And we have not had to use an adjuvant to achieve its effectiveness. This could be particularly important for a pediatric presentation. Um, some more example there on our anthrax data for thermal stability. Routinely, our, our, infer, our products are very strong in the thermal case. And as you can see here, the little injection site when it's put in, there's no bleeding, there's no bruising, there's no edema, there is no need actually for secondary protection. And of course, 
And like um, other more innovative technologies, say patches, uh, we guarantee the unit dose delivery every time. Two more slides uh, just to show you what we're doing. Uh, we do have a wealth of projects over and above COVID right now across all types of species. Uh, the proteinaceous, the live attenuated virus, many viral vectors, uh, including the MER vaccinia and the adenovirus ones. You'll be familiar with Chalox, I'm certain. Um, we are a beneficiary of Innovate UK, so thank you very much, UK PLC. We appreciate that. Uh, we are familiar with Imperial. We're doing work in DNA and MRA. And interestingly as well, we have some work uh, going on in animal health. But back to COVID-19, um, some of these projects up here, 60% of the vaccines in development for COVID-19 right now are of the proteinaceous basis. Our technology fits that perfectly. And I know very well that we can contribute to the COVID effort once those uh, products have first been proved both for safety and efficacy. Similarly goes for the viral vector-based systems as well. And in actuality, over and above the prophylactic vaccines, we have two opportunities where we're working with our partners on immunostimulants. So we're delivering an immunostimulant to the host to try and boost its immune system to deal with a pathogen in its own right. This might be very helpful in the asymptomatic patient. And because we can do self-administration and mail through the post, we may also be able to help them administer at home. I mentioned human factor studies. We've done many of these. Uh, this is some work we did a little bit over a year ago. Uh, broadly, everybody prefers needle and syringe um, so Implavax as opposed to needle and syringe, it's very important. Um, they like it because of many, many reasons uh, across the pieces. Whether you're a, a parent or, of a child or an infant, a recently vaccinated adult, high income nurse, nurses here, uh, but also the aid workers too. So truly we have a, a technology platform. So in conclusion, this is my final slide. Uh, I'm delighted with the progress that we've been able to make to date. Uniformly, we have seen that any vaccine we have put into Implapax format ends up with a better immune response. We're antigen agnostic, we're indication agnostic, and we have both prophylactic and therapeutic opportunities. The stability is second to none. It simplifies logistics. We are usually outside of the cold chain, and of course, that can help with shelf life. Um, cold chain is as important in uh, London as it is in Uganda. Uh, that's a simple fact of life. You've seen how easy it is to use. It's preferred by both subjects and healthcare professionals. And actually what we've been able to do is to, is to do this needle-free by design, but without any change in clinical practice. And that's really important when you're looking for adoption of a new technology. Finally, we think it's very highly value-added, getting rapid and safe to go. Ultimately, this is uh, safe, it's cost-effective, but minimal waste. And we're very confident of our competitive position, and we're delighted to be part of the UK vaccine uh, effort not only just for COVID-19, but also the wider world. I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of our presenters as well. We, we really covered quite a range of technologies there. So we'll shortly go to the panel Q&A session. Um, but while we pull the questions together, I'm really pleased that we've got Matthew Duchard, um, Chief Executive of the Vaccines Manufacturing and Innovation Centre, to give us a, an update on that. Thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks to, to the organisers and KTN for the opportunity to, uh, to talk today about uh, VMIC or the Vaccine Manufacturing Innovation Centre. Um, so VMIC is a, uh, a not-for-profit um, uh, company. Do you, uh, can you advance the slide one as well? Oh, thank you. Um, so it's a not, set up as a not-for-profit uh, company um, and re really with three main um, purposes in mind. Um, first and foremost, we're there to help vaccine developers really uh, take their um, products from discovery into the clinic uh, in a uh, efficient and an economic way um, and provide capacity to be able to do that. Uh, we're also there um, as a sort of a center of knowledge um, to provide knowledge transfer uh, and really develop a skilled workforce, whether it be training um, individuals for, for specific companies, whether it's uh, uh, speaking to uh, lectures for academics um, or, or going out into industry, uh, we're there to help sort of impart that knowledge back out again. Um, and thirdly, uh, we have a, um, a, a role in emergency response, and in particular now uh, for pandemic response. So in terms of the building itself, um, this is a, a, a just 
being built right now. It's been accelerated from the original uh, build plan that was meant to be, um, uh, was aimed to be completed at the end of 2022. Um, we've uh, accelerated the building into almost half that time to uh, have it ready in 2021. Um, it's a, a, about a seven and a half thousand square meter footprint. Um, it, it already has all the steelwork is up and the roof is on and it's starting to be fitted out. Um, and will consist of, of 10 GMP capable laboratories, four uh, GMP production suites, um, as well as two fast filling lines that will be capable of producing up to about a million doses a day each. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to that, it has some small scale filling areas. Um, so it's, it's there primarily to be a sort of technology agnostic center um, whereby we can help vaccine developers with whatever, whatever technology they're using to make vaccines to, bring, to, to really help develop them and bring that from, uh, as I mentioned, discovery into, out and into the clinic and into scale and also to provide um, a level of, of, of emergency response and pandemic response, in fact, as well. Um, so I think at that, that point I'll, I'll pause, as I know I only have a couple of minutes, and I think I've probably exceeded it already. So uh, th thanks everyone for your attention. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so now we can go over to the to the whole panel for a Q and A session. I'm sure the talks have stimulated lots of interesting questions. Um, my colleague Alan Cowie will act as question master, and uh, Steve Bagshaw will help facilitate the discussion. So over to you. Thank you very much, um, Karen. Uh, yes, we've been watching the uh, chat box for all of your comments and uh, questions. Lots of uh, good questions coming in. Um, and uh, we're going to kick off, though, with an open question to the panel. The, the COVID pandemic has necessitated rapid vaccine and treatment development. What technologies or developments will make this even faster in the future? Thanks, Alan. I'm going to act as the sort of the, uh, the, the front of house here um, in terms of just making sure that we, we answer those questions. So um, I'm going to rather unfairly go straight back to Matthew um, just to give us a, a first comment. And then the other five of you, if you could just perhaps just be ready with a, an answer. But fairly quickly, Matthew, what do you think? Which is the technology you think looking forward will, will has in, uh, uh, we are improving and will make it better for us to respond to COVID-19? So uh, it, very difficult question to answer, actually. And I think you partly gave the, the answer yourself at the, uh, the start of the introduction where you talked about uh, having multiple horses in the race. And, and at least from my experience of vaccine development, um, there, there is no one size fits all. So you do need to have multiple types of technologies for different applications. And uh, th the same applies for COVID. You know, we haven't got to a stage yet where we have efficacy readouts and we know exactly which vaccines are working and in which particular way. But what I am reasonably sure will happen is we'll find that um, certain vaccine technologies will work well for certain groups of people and uh, 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 other technologies will be more applicable for, for other sets of people. Uh, and it's unlikely that there will be a single answer that that kind of knocks it out of the park compared to everyone else. Um, and, and that applies to vaccine development in, in general, not just for COVID. So, you know, the one thing that it really does sort of highlight for me is, is the need to have lots of different approaches uh, and, and parallel development of those approaches. Right. Thanks. Simon, you talked about it not being a race. Great, you know, this is, um, sorry, I, uh, so this is Kristen, I think it's, it's a quick answer for me, it's, it's getting the safety data by investing in a platform that's proven, because once you have the safety data from other technologies or different vaccines on a platform, you can then kind of, I don't want to say skip, but you could then accelerate your toxicology package and some other packages to be able to get into the clinic quicker. And, and, and to the actual healthy subjects to see if you actually get the immune responses needed. Um, so I think from, from my perspective, it's investing in the right technologies. Yeah, I think just building on what's already been said, really agreeing with what everyone else has said. I think also having flexibility potentially there as well. So if a certain epitope doesn't work or there's an issue with it, you don't have to go right back to the beginning. You can re-engineer. And this is obviously where the nucleic acid 
vaccines have a potential advantage that is quicker to just go and get a different piece of DNA or a different piece of mRNA and insert into your platform. I think also, again, building into that, as I discussed, is the idea that maybe if intramuscular doesn't work, we look at other delivery routes, such as we've heard about today as well. Brilliant. Yeah. How about the other three? Laurent, do you have a comment? Well, I would say that uh, pretty much everything has been said, and uh, I, I do uh, agree with um, my colleagues that a platform, uh, and as we have seen actually, because if you look at the uh, the, the vaccines which are now in phase three, um, they are all about you know uh, repurposed um, uh, viral uh, vaccines, and and that means that these companies have effectively, uh, I may say, cashed in in uh, already a well-proven platform, which can be then you know adapted uh, very fast to to another type of uh, of threat, uh, viral or bacterial. Uh, as such, and, um, and and it's pretty rapid to to uh, now uh, sequence genomes and then get you know uh, bioinformatics to analyze the the sequences and get the epitopes and and then synthesize the DNA or RNA uh, very fast. I mean. That, that's what essentially this uh, pandemic is uh, is proving to uh, to us is that those companies who had effectively invested into uh, into this type of uh, flexible platforms and who have already uh, significant um, talks and uh, I mean essentially talks data safety data uh, are uh, in the forefront and uh, now it's it's difficult to foresee which new technology could surpass that. I think we have also to be a bit uh, patient and see uh, what this will give in, uh, for, for COVID-19. Yeah, I, I, uh, adding to the panel, uh, assuming that we can get something safe and efficacious, um, I've always uh, been a great believer in looking at delivery with a big D, you know, right from on, on a country level. And I really do think that challenge is not to be underestimated. Um, there is opportunity for many forms of delivery. Um, and I would really, just because we can make something which can be delivered, you know, uh, with a needle and syringe, maybe that's not the right, right way to go in the longer term. So I would encourage everybody to think a little bit more holistically about what needs to be done. It's certainly here to stay. Uh, and actually the ability also not just to think about um, therapeutic treatment or prophylaxis treatment of the pathogen itself. I do think there's some immunostimulant opportunities as well that could be. Uh, very readily and very quickly available. Thanks. And finally, Roger, you have a different perspective, I think. Uh, yes, I think it's it's definitely, well, from my opinion, it's it's definitely towards the gene-based systems, whether they're RNA or, or DNA. Uh, I'm very interested to see what happens with the AAV or the viral uh, delivery vehicle because it's, it's going to get a big push forward. Um, so very interested to see that. But I think also the non-viral systems, um, should be far more scalable and uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think gene-based non-viral system would be, would be something I'd like to see really push, push forward. Yeah, thanks Roger. And I think that word you used at the end there, scalable, is also really important. Um, what, what people seem to get is making those first doses, but when you need population scale doses, it's, um, it's, it's significant, isn't it, that ability to scale. We're going back to Alan for the next question. Thank you very much, Steve. So we've now got some questions for each of our uh, presenters. Um, this one is to uh, Laurent, who, uh, and it's uh, Jeff uh, asks, are there any uh, particular challenges in freeze drying of adjuvants? Uh, yes, that's. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's it's uh, it's indeed a, a well-known problem, in particular for the classical uh, aluminium-based uh, salts, uh, which are particulate adjuvants, and for which it is it's known that uh, these these materials cannot be frozen; otherwise, they lose uh, their immunogenic uh, properties. Um, so, indeed. Um, and there, there has been uh, developments and, and you know some research in this field for uh, preventing these um, if these adjuvants were to be frozen uh, for uh, delivery to, uh, to to distant places. Uh, then there's effectively some additives uh, which have been uh, tested successfully, um, and there's also um, new technologies uh, where where these these adjuvants are uh, essentially. Um, formulated into uh, nanoparticles, um, which are more stable and uh, which have also shown to have a, a different, um, uh, I mean, 
a different profile uh, in the immune response as well as the boosted uh, immune response uh, with regards to uh, to aluminium uh, classical aluminium adjuvants. Uh, uh, in terms of um, of what we do at Croda is that we are indeed working uh, partly uh, with these uh, these topics. You have to remember that we are not uh, <laughs> a vaccine uh, producing company. We are producing adjuvants, and uh, but we are of course collaborating with a number of. of uh, people, uh, both academics and private, uh, making vaccines. And um, we, um, we effectively uh, have uh, full uh, GMP programs, stability programs to, uh, to, to, to study and, and understand the, the stability of our adjuvants. Um, <clears throat> and uh, of course, they are, they are using vaccines. But the last thing I would like to say is that um, if one thinks about uh, stability of a vaccine, uh, in particular with regard to the, the, the cold chain, and you, you have to remember that ad an adjuvant is just one component, and uh, and uh, and it actually eventually uh, interacts with, with the antigen. So that's the study of the whole uh, vaccine formulation, which is in the end uh, important, and and uh, also to understand how the adjuvant is eventually stabilizing or destabilizing the uh, the antigen and the, the vaccine in particular. So we are also looking into these uh, these uh, areas um, for sure. Thank you very much. Um, let's take some more questions. This next one is for uh, Kristen from Procarium. Fatima asks, can oral administration really be administered anywhere? Um, do you still uh, or don't you still require clinical staff present in case of severe acute vaccine reactions? Yeah, that's a great question. And I kind of anticipate it, uh, both being as a pharmacist and, and kind of, uh, you know, hammering that point earlier in the presentation. Um, you know, the extent of community pharmacy practice vary across each country, and only approximately 30% of pharmacies can administer vaccinations. So these countries are the US, UK, South Africa, Philippines, Costa Rica. So some are, are low and middle income country settings and some are as we call high income country settings. Um, pharmacists actually are seen as clinicians in, in many of these countries and therefore they're able to administer vaccines. But again, I think this always comes back to, I think in, you know, distribution of vaccines comes back to education and educating whether it's a healthcare provider, if it's a pharmacist or, or the local clinic or nurse. Um, but yes, I truly believe that similar to the, the UK and US where you actually can walk into a vaccine and either take the vaccine home with you, such as TY21A Vivotif, or get administered at the pharmacy, that this is possible through education and, and training programs. Thank you very much. Let's see how many we can get through. This next one is for Simon Newman from Nanogenics. And it's Helen who's asking, does Liptide uh, share, like most uh, adeno-based delivery systems, possible immune stimulation, limiting the requirements for booster and repeat dosing? Okay, um, thank you for the question. So I think I'm interpreting this correctly, because obviously one of the potential drawbacks using adenovirus is if you use it more than once, your body actually has an immune response against the vector itself which might limit the ability to say to have yearly injections if required or booster injections. So with regard to liptide, which isn't the virus, it is an artificial uh, peptide, all the in vivo data to date, whether it be airway delivery or systemic deliveries, we can give multiple doses and not see any evidence of an immune response. So we think that's potential another sort of key differentiator is as well as being robust and simple to manufacture, is it could be given multiple times as and when required to give boosters or annual vaccinations. Thank you, hope that uh, answers uh, the question there, Helen. Um, next one is for Roger at uh, AQ. Who, um, who's asked by uh, Safwan the question, uh, what is the neutralizing agent in AQ? Now that's a great question and I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> um, so, it's it's a, it's basically a cyclic molecule, uh, synthetic, um, that has uh, um, basically this ability to to capture, hold, and release material. So it has uh, effectively sticky ends to it, and so it, it's very effective at doing host gas chemistry, uh, and and particular and binding uh, amino acids and peptide 
sequences. Uh, and that's the, the material that we've spent uh, the last uh, five, six years scaling up. Um, but we have been applying it mainly uh, to the capture of VOCs, so small molecule uh, gases, and particularly malodors and that, and it's being applied uh, across a number of different uh, sort of air quality applications. But we have now discovered that um, this, this ability to recognize uh, and do host gas chemistry with it uh, is also very effective against the surface of, of viruses. So uh, it's an interesting time. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. I've got a question here for David Hipkiss and uh, an anonymous uh, contributor asks, uh, your platform relies on a number of different technologies coming together to deliver the benefits that you describe. Can the individual elements be used by third parties to provide improvement by themselves? For example, could the solid dose be administered by a third party device? Um. That's a very good question, and I, I'm pleased people have seen the potential value in the technology. Um, I guess uh, I would encourage you to uh, ask the uh, questioner to, to contact me directly in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question here from, uh, this is from Matthew uh, Vemick. Um, a questioner asks, how does the UK create more vaccine development units? Um, goes on to say there are many professors, uh, but uh, too few vaccine technical developers. So, um, good question, and uh, I, I think you know one of the things that um, one of the reasons that Vemic has come about is that there has been historically a, a little bit of a gap um, between what's been a very good discovery engine within the UK, and then the ability to translate that into um, uh, products that can be taken into the clinic. Um, and so, you know, one of the purposes of, of, of Vemic um, and a, a number of other initiatives that are going on as well is to really um, put the capacity on the ground to be able to, to help with that development um, and manufacture. So it's not just about making GMP material, but it's also about that kind of journey from discovery into the clinic and being able to scale up and how do you do all that successfully. Um, and one of the things that, that BMIC is, is, um, has been set up to do specifically is to really take that knowledge and, you know, use it and reuse it in a way that, that people can, um, can really take their product to the clinic quickly without sort of making some of the classic mistakes that other people have made in, in, in the past because the learning's already there at the centre and can, can already be applied. Thank you, Matthew. And um, we've got just one more and I'll, I will use this to throw back to, to Steve. And this is for you, um, Steve. And uh, the questioner asks, uh, what is being done centrally to plan for a lack of air freight capacity um, as assessed this week by IHS Market to deliver vaccines globally? And who do we talk to to assist with planning uh, this effort? Great question. And it's one of those that has been thrown up. And I think as we've gone through the last three months, as we've worked our way through the supply chain, we've kept coming up against these issues. Um, if you go back only um, two months ago, we were worrying about things were traveling uh, um, and, and where supplies were traveling. And here we're now talking about if we get to the, if we get to the, uh, the promised land of having effective vaccines, how do we move around the world? Um, PHE are running, so Public Health England um, are running that, sit, that part of the process. <clears throat> there is a um, stream within the vaccine task force, and I'd be very happy to pass the name on to whoever it is that's asked for that to just put them in contact so that we can put them in contact with the PHE and the uh, vaccine task force lead in that area but it is a key area and it's an area i know that they're looking at brilliant and thanks for everyone for all the questions so i think is it it's back to you now karen i think okay thanks alan and to the uh, the rest of the panel and for everyone who posted questions up as well um if we didn't get round to uh, answering all of the questions. We'll see what we can do to collate what we didn't get onto uh, and circulate some thoughts after the meeting, um, along with contact details in case people want to get in touch with our presenters. 
So next, uh, we've got Gordon Ford from Innovate UK and my KTN colleague, Gabriela Juarez-Martinez, and they're going to give you a whistle-stop update on some of the innovation funding schemes that are open or on their way. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I am Gordon Ford. I sit in the health team at Innovate UK, and I want to just spend five minutes talking about the latest £30 million biomedical catalyst competition that opened on Monday this week. Uh, some of you might know the Biomedical Catalyst. It's a programme of funding that has been uh, around since 2012. Uh, it was created to support SMEs carry out early stage innovative development work to enable market access or attract further investment for later stage development and commercialization, uh, recognizing that there's a funding gap in early stage development in healthcare. Um, there's a broad scope for the program uh, and for this competition. Uh, we are looking for projects uh, from SMEs that are developing solutions to a healthcare challenge. Uh, and it's technology, the program's technology agnostic. Uh, we have funded uh, digital health projects, projects in drug discovery, medical devices, diagnostics, advanced therapies. It's not just for product development. Uh, we will also fund service development or, or, or in innovation in manufacturing processes. Um, so long as it addresses a defined healthcare challenge. This competition is for the early and late stages of the Biomedical Catalyst uh, and projects should uh, last between 12 and 36 months with total project costs of £250,000 to £4 million and SMEs can typically get 70% of total project costs funded through our grants. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the latest competition opened on Monday there is a deadline on the 7th of October at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, oops, one more slide. I have one more slide for you. And this is just to explain what I mean by the early stage and late stage scope. So the Biomedical Catalyst has four competition streams, uh, all the way from feasibility, feasibility studies, primer studies or proof of concept, early stage, which are typically preclinical evaluations, uh, right through to late stage, which can be first in man studies, for example. Uh, the TRLs we're looking for, for this competition, which is early and late stage, is typically around six to TRL eight and not beyond TRL eight. Um, so uh, details, all the details about eligibility for this, uh, how to apply, are on the Innovate UK competition site. Uh, there is a full briefing, because I know we don't have much time here. There's full briefing online on Tuesday that you can also find a link for on our competition site. And if you're not available on Tuesday, it will be recorded and posted there uh, next week. Uh, and with that, I will pass you on to Gabriella to talk about some other opportunities. Thanks, Gordon. Well, in addition to the biomedical um, catalyst, there are other funding opportunities worth considering. The first one is the Vaccine Hub platform funding, which is for feasibility studies up to £100,000 and open to members of the Vaccine Hub only. However, you can become a member for free by going to their web page and completing their membership form. The second one is the Sustainable Innovation Fund from Innovate UK, and this is to help recover from COVID-19 in a sustainable manner. There are two types of grants here. One is an SBRI phase one for uh, project costs up to 60,000 pounds. And the second one is for project costs up to 100,000 pounds, but it is not an SBRI and the de minimis or state aid funding rules apply. Next is the UKRI open call for research and innovation ideas to address COVID-19. Uh, there is no limit for project cost, but please check the priority areas and the projects that have been funded already. Next is manufacturing made smarter, which is for digital technologies to transform the supply chain. There are two types of grants here. 
The first one is for feasibility projects up to half a million. And the second is for industrial research projects up to 3 million. And finally, we have the knowledge transfer partnerships, which is a three-way collaboration between a business, academ an academic or research organization, and a graduate. And for more information, please contact the KTN, either my colleague Karen, Marcel, or myself. Thank you. So thank you, Gordon and Gabriella. Um, so I'm just going to pass you back to Steve Bagshaw now uh, for some closing remarks. Thanks, Karen. Wow, what an hour and a half. If you look at um, the six people that presented to you, all of them were in business back six months ago in that normal time of January 2020. None of them potentially were thinking too hard about COVID-19 right at that moment. However, here we are six months on, and you've heard how in each of those, uh, both the, the business and the way in which they're using science, they're really driving forward and using that, using that know-how and knowledge they've got to potentially give us ways of creating better responses to the coronavirus. You've seen and heard about different ways of potentially deploying the, virus, the, the vaccine. You've also heard a really novel way in terms of potentially helping us in our daily lives, in terms of knocking out the, vaccine, the, the, vir the virus in the air or on surfaces. You've also seen different ways in which that delivery, in terms of oral, in terms of the gold standard, in terms of the ways in which you could use adjuvants to improve yield or improve the way in which it's um, again delivered can be done. Across the industry, there are many other examples and you may yourselves be sat on those kind of examples of ways in which you through collaboration could be working with us or with other companies to improve the ways in which by working together, we actually do find faster ways of making life more normal again. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to our presenters as well. And whatever you're doing, please do look for partners and collaborators and use the network that there is here in the UK. One of the things, one of the legacies that we want out of this is that the UK is seen as a place where you can develop solutions that are innovative. And it is a place where, as Matthew's talked about, UK PLC's corporate knowledge and know-how becomes something that's a real asset to the way and to the world in terms of the way we deal with crises like COVID-19. So thank you for that. And I'm going to hand back to Karen now, who's going to close the webinar. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to all of our speakers as well. And thank you for everyone on the webinar um, for your time. So um, all that remains to be said is that we will now close the webinar. Thank you.